Amen. God is good all the time, and God is right. Amen. Amen. Greetings in the name of Jesus this morning. I wanted to start out this morning with a story of a young man in Australia who was growing up in high school. As he grew up and was going through school, uh, all the way through high school, they were telling him that uh, the world is, you know, hundreds of millions and billions of years old, and the earth is, and, and that we all came from monkeys, and the whole evolution story. They were telling him this, but at home his father was telling him, but that's not what the Bible says. And he would say, but dad, you know, the science, the science says this, and the science says that, and his dad would just shake his head and say, son, I don't know much about science. But I'm pretty sure at the end of the day, God is right. And he continued through high school and went through college and all the way through he's hearing all this stuff about how we came from monkeys and they came from whatever, scum. And one day, when he was, after he got out of college and he was actually a high school teacher, one day he got a hold of a book that was written by a doctor, somebody that was highly educated, and they began to point out all of the flaws in the theory of evolution and point out how far outside of science it actually was. And he took all the money he had and bought all the books that he could afford. And he set up a speaking tour and he went around Australia from high school to high school and he talked about creation. And he sold all the books. So he took all the money and bought more books. <laughs> and he continued to go around speaking about this. And all this happened when I was a child. But when I was a child, if there was a debate in the University of Iowa between creation and evolution, the room would fill up with people and everybody would mock the creationist. That man ended up coming over to the United States and building a multi-million dollar museum called Creation Museum, followed by the Ark. And he has changed the debate so radically that in today's world, a university will not bring a creationist into debate. Whatever the world wants to think, they're welcome to think, amen? But I can promise you that at the end of the day, God is right. God is right. <clears throat> I'm going to start this morning in this thing about respect for life by just reading a couple verses from John 21, and then I'm going to close that and go on to something else. In John 21, when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Do you love me? And he said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And he said unto him, Feed my sheep. And he said unto him the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Now, he goes on to have a conversation there with him, and, and there's different words that were used there that we could go into a long ways, but I just want you to think about that this morning. What if Jesus was sitting right beside you, and he said, John, Henry, Peter, you love me. What would you say to him? What are you asking God to believe? What are you asking God to believe today? If Jesus was sitting beside you and said, do you love me, and you said yes, what are you asking him to believe? 
Jesus is looking at Peter and say, says, do you love me? Do you know what had happened just a few days before? What happened? Peter denied him three times. And now Jesus is sitting there looking at him saying, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. But what was he trying to get Jesus to believe? What are you trying to get Jesus to believe? This is a question we're going to start with, and we'll come around to it at the end again. What are you asking God to believe about you? What, what are you trying, what are you and I today, what are we trying to get God to believe? We're going to go to Hebrews chapter 11 and start there with uh, verse 24, but it, we're headed for verse 26. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect. He had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. For esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. What is respect? What is respect? When you think about respect, what does respect mean? This comes out of a dictionary here, and it's a Greek word from the Greek dictionary. It says, to look away from everything else. To look away from everything else. Moses, the Bible says, had respect unto the recompense of the reward. That means he was looking away from everything else except the reward. He had respect to look away from everything else, to intently regard, to highly respect. So here's my question to you today. Who do you respect? Or maybe it would be a better thing for me to ask, what do you respect? What do you and I respect? Now we were talking last night, uh, we, we had a, uh, a little bit of time there where, where we were talking with, with John, for those of you that were there, and we were talking about some of these guys, I'm not going to leave their pictures up there, um, but we're talking about some of these men. And, and the reason that I bring that up is because um, there's not a question when you're around these people what they respect. I'll tell you what they don't respect. They don't respect what the government says about whether or not they can evangelize. They don't respect what their neighbors think. And they don't respect their own life. They have a respect for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? They are focused on that. And they are so focused on that that everything else just kind of dims down and, and, and goes away because they have a focus on one thing. The, there's people there who, <laughs> and just there's so many of these stories that, that I could, I sit and listen to these guys tell stories and I just, I feel like I'm in a storybook or in a surreal world because I can't believe that I'm listening to people that actually act like this. Where, where they go intentionally into places that they know their life is at risk and they do it without any hesitation. And they get picked up by the secret police and put in prison. The one guy got thrown in jail. Nobody knew where he was at for four days. The whole church is together fasting and praying because they lost this guy. They can't find him. And the, nobody would say they had him. The police, nobody would admit they had him. Like nobody would, would talk about. Uh, it's, it's a completely different world there then here you don't know, uh, you don't always know what's going on. Like <laughs> this, this John that was there last night that we were talking about has been picked up different times and, uh, you know, like abducted and, and whatever, and he doesn't always even know who has him. Like it's, it's kind of an uncertain world. But anyway, he, um, the, the guy ends up getting put in prison with a whole bunch of really violent radicals and he's in prison, he says, the, the prison is so crowded there was not even room to lay down. Like everybody had to stand because you're shoulder to shoulder. 
and he's in there in this prison and people are like, well, what are you in here for? And he says, well, I'm in here for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. It goes something like this. And he lit up on him in there in the prison and started preaching. It caused such a disruption, they pulled him out of the prison and drug him in front of one of the magistrates. And, and it was a, a military judge, a, a hardcore radical Muslim, really. And, and he puts him in front of this guy, and the guy says, well, what are you in here for? You're causing problems. And he says, well, I'm causing problems for the sake of the gospel. And it goes something like this. <laughs> and, and he lit up on him. And the guy sat there and listened to him for a while. And he said, come here. And so he walked up there to the front, and he gave him a business card. And he said, if anybody gives you any problem for preaching this, you just tell them that this is my number, and they should call me. And they let him go. Guess where he went as soon as he got out? Straight back to the church to get another bag of Bibles and head off into an area he's not supposed to be in. Why? Because he has no respect for anything except the gospel. Do you understand what I'm saying? So here's my question to you today. What would it take for you to live at that kind of level? What would it take for you and I to live at that kind of a level where we would have no respect for anything except for the gospel? What do you think that would look like in your life? Because I'm going to ask you another question. In two words, in two words, what is the most important thing that the young people in this room thought about when they were getting ready for church today? What is it that we respect? You know what it is most of the time, if we're, if we're cold-heartedly honest? Others' opinions. And see, when we start to respect others' opinions, we must, by definition, disrespect something else. You, you have to understand that the idea and the concept of respect has inherently inside of it disrespect. You cannot respect everything. You have to pick something you're going to respect, which by default means you disrespect everything else. So what is it that we respect? Because as soon as we say, I am going to respect other people's opinions, we must by default disrespect God's. Ouch. And we begin to disrespect the gospel. So we're talking today about respect because the Bible says that Moses had a respect. He had a respect for God and for God's plan. And he's, he's put in a palace and given all of the nice things of life and all of the training and all of the schooling and all of the possibilities and all of the future and all of everything that he could dream of. And he turned away from it in disrespect because he respected the reproach of God's people. Amen? There's something he respects. In order for him to respect, he has to disrespect something else. So what is it that you respect? What, what is it that we think about when we're getting ready for church? So we're, so we're talking here the other day a little bit. I'll go back to some of this. <clears throat> we're talking about the idea that somewhere out there in outer space is God. Amen? And inside of God is this red blob, this Christ that the people talked about. They understood that to be Christ. And we're down here on the planet Earth somewhere. We're not exactly sure. Somewhere between the beginning of time and the end of time, we're standing there on the planet. And there's a place out there where there is no beginning and no end. And that place with no beginning and no end is called eternity. And when God says, I'm going to give you life, there's some places it says he's going to give us everlasting life. Somebody tell me, what does everlasting mean? What does everlasting mean? It doesn't have any end. Do you know what the word eternal means? It doesn't have any beginning. Not only does it not have any end, it doesn't have any beginning. And Jesus said, I'm going to give unto you 
eternal life. That means I'm going to give you a life that never started. Amen. How many lives are there that never started? One. It's the life of God. Amen. It never started. And he said, I'm going to give you eternal life. And we talked about that, that God's going to take that life and he's going to pull it out of himself and put it inside of your human flesh. This is the mystery that we preach, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is, I, I go to places that people say, <clears throat> I ask people different questions. What do you do in your church? Well, one guy said, well, in our church, when somebody gives an invitation and some, they raise their hand, you know. Okay, now I'm a Christian. I, whatever. I don't know what people do in, in Dunkard Brethren or German Baptist. or what, I don't really care. What I want to know is this. At what point in your life did the God of heaven reach in, pull his life out, and put it inside of your human flesh? Because, my friend, it either happened or it didn't. You know, according to the Bible, there's only two kinds of people, and both of them are dead. There are those who are dead in Christ. There's those who are dead. The Bible says, we'll get to that in a little bit. For you are dead and your life is hid with Christ. And there are those who are dead in trespasses and sins. But you're all going to be dead to something and you're going to be alive to something. Amen. You don't have a choice about that. Nelson Coleman used to say, you can either be a fool for the devil or you can be a fool for Christ. I want to be Christ fool. Whose fool are you? There's a whole bunch of things in life that we don't actually have a choice about. Did you know that? There are, we, we talk about choice, and choice is exciting. But there are things in life we don't have a choice about. You know one of the things you cannot choose? You cannot choose whether or not you will bow your knee to Jesus Christ. You cannot choose that. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're an atheist or a Muslim or a Hindu or anybody else on the face of the earth. You will bow your knee to Jesus Christ. The Bible says, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow. And that's a fact. Now you can choose when you do it. <laughs> you can do it now by choice, or you can wait till then and do it by force, but you will bow your knee. Amen. It's not optional. So God comes along, of course, and he takes this life. We talked about that. He takes this life, he pulls it out, puts it inside of a girl, becomes a baby, and the earth is not particularly fond of that life, and so we took him <clears throat> by wicked hands and put him on a cross crucified him without understanding that when he was crucified, it was actually making a way that we could be seated in Christ in heavenly places. Amen. And I just think that ought to make something jump up and down inside of you. I, if there isn't something jumping up and down inside of you, there's something wrong. I mean to tell you what. I don't understand when I go into these places and people sitting around and they and you got the joy of the Lord. Nelson used to say, if you got the joy of the Lord in your heart, notify your face. I wonder if so many of God's people walk around looking like they're weaned on a dill pickle. There's something jumping up and down inside of us. Amen. It's the life of God. God has put his life inside of us. To me, there's not anything... We, we talked a little bit the other day about the idea of what God values, what's low in God's value and what's very high in God's value. One of the highest thing in God's value is his life. Amen. It's his life, and so he takes that life, and he pulls it out, and he puts it inside of your human flesh. Do you think that's important to him? Let me ask you a question. Do you think anything else is important to him? Listen, God is obsessed with that life. Amen. God's not amused with Steve Stutzman. He's not amused with you. He's not fascinated by your ability. Somehow or another we get the idea that I'm going to do the right thing. I have decided I'm going to do the right thing while well, hooray for you. Do you think God's amused by that? I'll tell you what God's fascinated with. What God's fascinated with is when he takes his life and puts it inside a human flesh and he sits back and blows on that life and it bursts into flame and it begins to consume us. Amen. So we have the great balance scale of the judge of all the earth. 
who sits there on his judgment throne and he has this balance scale and when you walk into his throne room your sins go down on one side and it's ways way down here like this and there's no way to balance the scale until you put the blood of Jesus on the other side amen and when you do that the scale the mighty scale of justice is balanced with the blood of Jesus which is pure and innocent blood amen and when that innocent blood balances the scale in the courtroom of heaven the the judge of all the earth brings down his gavel with a thunderous clap and he says justified and all of heaven jumps up and down and screams and yells and shouts and throws a party. That's what the Bible says. There's great rejoicing in the sight of God when one sinner repents. Amen? And God balances that scale. And because he says now you are justified, you are balanced, now he can take his life and pull it out and put it inside of your human flesh. See, here's the thing. I'm asking you today. If he takes that life and puts it inside of you, how much do you respect it? How much do you respect that life? Because I'm trying to tell you, these guys over there in the Middle East, somebody comes along, puts an AK-47 to their head and says, you get rid of that life or I'm going to blow your brains out. And they're like, well, you might as well start shooting. Because that life is not for sale for any price, period. Amen. It's an eternal life of God and you can't buy it. Amen. I... <laughs> There isn't anything else, my friend. There's no amount of money and farms and businesses. There's no amount of respect. There's no position in this world of president of whatever. There's, no, there's nothing to be compared with that life. Nothing. That life is everything. Amen. It's the life of God. And he takes it and says, I'm going to invest it inside of your human body. Wow! Wow! The Bible, and Paul writes about it. He says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power might be of God and not of... <laughs> oh, I don't know. I mean, there's maybe other things people get excited about. People say, you know, they get all excited about the Buckeyes. Rah, rah. This reality is not going away. Amen? And if somebody wants to come and try and take that away from me, I'm not interested. There's, what do you have you're going to buy it with? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? <clears throat> and then God reaches down from heaven and he puts a piece of his life inside of us. Amen? And, and you see these two realities, and I'm not going to go into a whole bunch of this this morning. But you, you see these two realities going on all the way through Scripture, and if you start to understand that in Scripture there are two realities presented, one of them is in Christ in heavenly places, and the other one is on the earth, you will start to understand a lot of the dichotomies like the, the uh, what are the, all the arguments, the um, Calvinist and the Arminian. The Calvinist is arguing that thing up there, and the Arminian is arguing this one. And the older I get, the less I understand the argument. They're both there, people. Hello. By the way, God is right. Say it with me. God is right. When was the last time God was wrong? Okay, so if God looks at something and he sees it a certain way, is he right or wrong? And if we disagree with him, we are? You may want to think about that a little bit. Because God looks at us up here and he says, this is who you are. <laughs> now somebody tell me, where's that at again? In heavenly places, in Christ. Somebody tell me what's not in heavenly places, in Christ. What's not there? There's no sin, no mistakes, no disease, no imperfection of any kind. Amen. So when God sees you in that place right there, he says, wow, and this guy is no sin, no imperfection, no mistakes of any kind. I'm not sure his wife would even agree with that.
Because, see, we're looking down here and we're saying, in my experience, I struggle with this. In my experience, I have this. In my experience, I have this. In my experience, I have this. But God's saying, but in your, in your identity, it's not there. And part of what's going on in this world is you and I are trying to decide, are we going to focus on our experience or are we going to focus on our identity? Because you cannot do both. You can only respect one. <laughs> so who writes your identity? Who is it that writes your identity? And what is the possibility that he's wrong? Like, you, we, we go to this thing. <clears throat> we look at our life and we say, well, here's, here's what's going on. There's immorality and homosexuality and thieves and revilers and extortioners and all that. And then it comes along and God says, but you are washed, you are justified, you are perfect. I'll show you the scripture right here in 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves of mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But ye are washed, ye are sanctified, ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So he's saying, I gave you a new identity. If I gave you a new identity up there in heavenly places, do you accept it or not? <laughs> it's, it's just so fascinating to me. <clears throat> you have a song in your book, um, number 358, and it goes something like this. I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day still praying as I'm onward bound Lord plant my feet on higher ground sing with me Lord lift me up and let me stand by faith a higher way than I have found, Lord, plant my feet. <clears throat> you know what the writer of that song was seeing? Two realities. There's one down here, and there's one up there. Lord, lift me up and let me stand on that heaven's table land. Amen? You know what the next verse says? My heart has no desire to stay where doubts arise and fears dismay. For faith has caught the joyful sound, the song of saints on higher ground. I'm, I'm not making this stuff up, people. This is an idea that is all the way through your songbook. It's all the way through your Bible. There are two realities. God is telling us to look at the one that is eternal. Somebody brought this up the other day, Colossians 3.1. If ye then be risen with Christ. If. You notice it starts out with an if. If. So let's back up again. Oops. Sorry, I was going forward. If you went up through this cross and you are now seated up there, if you are up there, then, he says, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth, for ye are dead. Point blank statement. You're dead. You know what that means? You know what the word dead means? The word means dead means separated. What he's trying to tell you is your identity has been separated out of your body. We walk around and we say, I'm tall, I'm short, I'm Hispanic, I'm black, I'm a man, I'm a woman, I'm fat, I'm bald, I'm blonde. All of them are statements about the physical. Who thought that up? That's not who you are. It's not your identity. God has reached into your body and pulled your identity out of you and put it in Christ, in heaven and places. Amen. That's either true or it's a lie. And if God said it, I'm going to believe it. Amen. I may not understand it. I may not understand how it all works. But if God said it, that's the way it is. And he said, if ye then be risen with Christ, set your affection on things above. 
Where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God, set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth, for ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear. Amen. It's the truth. You know why we don't get excited about it? We don't really believe it. That's the honest truth. You know why we don't believe it? Because we don't respect it. Do you know what it's going to take for us to respect it? We're going to have to learn to disrespect some other things. Every man, the Bible says, that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken unto him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. Wow. I could go off on this sermon and you wouldn't get lunch till tomorrow. <clears throat> Somebody made a, looked at that scripture and wrote a song. The wise man built his... And then, of course, there's a foolish man built his house upon the sand. And then there's this all-important third verse that says, build your life on the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't really know who thought that up. I'm sure it sounds like a nice platitude, but it is not actually what the Bible says. Do you know what the Bible actually says? What I think the verse should say is it says, it should say, build your life on here and do. Jesus said, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and we make Christianity so complicated. My friend, it's not complicated. God takes his life and he sends it down here and puts it inside of you. Now when that life comes in there, it starts talking to you. You're supposed to hear what that life says and do it. How complicated is that? Hear Wow. Isn't that profound? Actually, it is so absolutely elementary simple that the youngest child can understand it. Hear. He that heareth these things of mine and doeth them. You know what we do in American culture? We say, I'm going to hear what God says and then I'm going to understand it. And after I understand it, then I will do it. You know what that's called? It's called idolatry of the mind. Jesus did not tell you, understand what I'm saying and then do it. He said, if I say it, and by the way, he actually said, if you do what I say, then you will understand it. And we have made an idolatrous thing of the human mind in Western civilization. And we say, well, I'm going to hear what Jesus says, and then I'm going to study it until I understand it. And then if I actually feel like it, I'll do it. And we're worshiping what we feel and what we think instead of our God. Because if he says something, you just do it. Amen? You don't really have to know why. You just do what he says. Like, how complicated is that? <laughs> Amen? What ends up happening is we end up with a, with a sense of idolatry that we don't really understand. And we don't understand who it is that we are actually respecting. We don't understand who do we respect. We end up respecting our own mind more than we do the God that made it. And that's just... The Bible says that in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. There's a spirit at work in the world around us. I want you to understand something. Your culture that you live in is driven by a devil. If you go out here and you bow down to your culture and you do what they say and you line up your mind with them, then you are obeying a devil. You are hearing a devil and doing what he says. Do you not understand that whoever you yield yourself, servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey. You can't get away from it. If you're going to go out and listen, to, the Bible's very clear that there is a demon running culture. And that's true in the U.S. It's true anywhere in the world. And if people go to their culture and they turn toward their culture and bow down and do whatever their culture says, they are in fact hearing and doing what a demon says. Which just doesn't seem like a brilliant idea to me. <clears throat> 
Know ye not that whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, him you are. So we, we have the, the children of Israel bowing down to an idol. The reason that they were bowing down to an idol is because of what they were pers persuaded of inside of their mind. They're bowing, they made a, ga a, a calf of gold, excuse me, and they bow down to worship it. And they, they make, you know, the reason is because inside they believed that they were slaves. There were three solid realities inside of their mind that were burned into their heart and mind. Number one is I am a slave. Number two is I am forsaken. And number three, I belong under a system. And because they believed those three things, they would turn and build a golden calf. It is a picture of almost every, I don't know, church and college and anything else I can think of in the world today is that people are persuaded that we are slaves and we're forsaken and we belong under a system. And it needs to stop. Because God is telling us the truth. Jesus says, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. <laughs> there he is again, here do. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him and will manifest myself unto him. So we end up with these two realities that are going on. Are we immoral, insufficient, and nobody that makes mistakes and we just don't have it? Or are we washed and sanctified and justified and perfect, a son or daughter that is loved and is precious and is capable? Which one do you believe? Which one do you believe about yourself? Because, see, this thing down here is something that we say about ourselves and that we say about each other. But up here is what God says about us. And when was the last time that God was wrong? And here's the thing that I think it's, it's hard for me to understand or to communicate in this whole thing of respecting the life that God put inside of you. Because we, we, we end up believing... We end up being earth conscious. We are earth dwellers. We dwell on the earth and we are conscious of the earth and the advertisements and how our hair looks and whether or not we have Amber Crombie written on our shirt. And we're conscious of all this stuff, but we are not conscious of a reality that is out there that is greater than this one will ever be. Amen. Paul says, which one do you think is greater? That which is created or that which is a creator? Hello, which one do you think is bigger? The creator is greater, amen? Can you see the creator? No. Can you see the created? Yes. Then therefore, it by default would be perfectly obvious that what you cannot see is greater than what you can see. That's a fact. When are we going to stop focusing on what we see and start looking at what we cannot see? Amen. Because if you're going to respect what you see, you by default disrespect what you cannot see. And if you will focus on what you cannot see, you will by default begin to disrespect what you can see. You follow where I'm going? Am I, am I going through this? Is it making sense? I, I don't know. If, I got a buddy that's over there in Africa. He's driving through the bush one day with another guy's driving. They're going through the bush. And all of a sudden, the, hor the, the horrible thing that you don't want to have happen in the Middle East or in Africa or whatever is you don't want to <laughs> come to an unofficial roadblock <laughs> where there's a whole bunch of guys jump out in front of you with AK-47s and they're sitting there going like this. And one guy comes over to the window and stucks his gun in the window and says, I shoot you, I shoot you. He said the first thing that went through his mind was anger. And he looked at the guy and he started shouting at him. And he said, who do you think you are? Do you not understand who I am? I'm the son of a king. You don't stick that pea shooter in my face. And he grabbed a gun and ripped it off of the guy and threw it on the ground. And he told the driver, drive. And the driver took off driving and everybody's like, who was that? Well, I'll tell you who it was. It was somebody who believed what they could not see. Amen. They're the son of a king. And he's saying, you don't have a right to shoot me. If you did, you'd already be done. <laughs> and I'm a son of the Most High God, and you don't have a right to do anything to me unless God okays it. And he hasn't. So I'm driving. It's a true story. By the time the guys figured out who they had let go, well, I was a little bit late. I wonder how many times God would like to do things with us and he doesn't do them because we are respecting what we see and we are disrespecting what we cannot see. What are you going to respect? What are you going to respect? So 
So if you say to me, well, Steve, I'm going to respect eternal life. God took eternal life and put it inside of me. This week, I'm going to respect that eternal life. Then my question is, how are you going to show it to me this week? How are you going to prove to me this week that you respect eternal life and you disrespect everything else? And maybe a better question is, how are you going to prove it to God? You can fool me. You can never fool God. Amen? So how are you going to prove to God this week that you're going to respect that life more than anything else? And how are you going to show disrespect this week? And I end up right back where I started. What are you asking God to believe? <clears throat> I'm going to close with this story today. Back in the early part of the 1800s, there was a man in Assam, India, who went far away to, he heard about something, and he went a ways away, he met a missionary, and the guy explained to him about Jesus. He came back to his village, and he began to tell his wife about Jesus Christ. And she got born again. And both of them, something changed inside, amen? Because the God of heaven reached in, pulled his life out, and put it inside of their human flesh. Well, that life came into a village that was steeped in its own occultism and culture and there was an immediate collision in the spirit world and the whole village gets upset and they call this man up there and the, the village chief brought this man out there in front of the whole village and he had his soldiers standing there with their spears and he said to him today you will renounce Jesus And the men stood there and said, but I have decided to follow Jesus. He was standing there with his wife and his two sons. And the chief turned to the soldiers and said, spear the sons. And they took their spears and ran them through the boys. And the boys curled up in pain and agony vomiting blood and dying in front of him on the sand. And the chief said, now you will renounce Jesus. And the man said, if no one joins me, still I will follow. And the chief said, spear his wife. And they ran four spears through her and she crumpled up on the ground, dying on the sand in front of him. And the chief said, now you will renounce Jesus. And the man fell to his knees and he said, the cross before me, the world behind me. And the chief said, kill him. And they ran their spears through him. And that whole family had supper with the king that night. Something happened in that whole village. A strange silence settled over it. And in the next two years, almost everybody in the village got born again. A missionary heard about it and wrote it into a song. That song has been translated into every language of any place I've ever been. I've heard people sing it in so many different languages I lost track of it. That story, by the way, is in Wikipedia if you want to look it up. I would like for you to just stand with me right now. And I want to pray. Father God, you are the king.
You are the one who found a way through Jesus Christ to put your life inside of us. But we understand, God, that that life that you put in us is never going to be all that popular on the earth. But Lord Jesus, I declare today that nothing else in my world means anywhere close to as much to me as that life does. Because it's important to you and it's precious to you. It is the life of an eternal God. And I am complete, completely committed to that life, to follow it to the end of the earth, whatever you say. And as your heads are bowed today, I just want to ask you, inside of yourself, how important is that life to you? What does it mean to you? Can we just sing together before him today? I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. Jesus, you are right. Your ways are right. Your word is right. Your truth is right. And we want to be completely committed to that. God, if there's any place in this room, someone who's never met you and doesn't know the reality of who you are and how you explode your life and your love inside of our heart, I pray that you would arrest that soul and you would wrestle with them and you would bring them to a place of freedom and life life in the name of Jesus thank you God for who you are thank you for this time watch over us and guide us in your way in Jesus name <coughs>